Welcome back to McMaster University course Computer Science 1JC3 Introduction to Computational Thinking. I am Bill Farmer. We're going to continue discussing the topic of data. Last time we talked about some fully analog uh, media and we mentioned that we have fully analog media for sound stationary visual image, and moving visual image. So here I mention that one example of this is movie film. I should have also mentioned there's another possibility. This is called analog video. This is a kind of video that was used before we had digital video. And it is, it is stored and captured much the same way as audio, instead of, instead of capturing a sequence of sound, uh, a continuous sound, we're capturing a continuous moving image. Uh, so, so you can think of analog video as fully analog, uh, movie video is fully analog in the sense it's on an analog uh, medium, but it's organized as a sequence of stationary visual images. Okay, so let's move on to file formats. This is a topic we've talked about before. We've mentioned how there's basically two categories of files. Text files, which are composed of ASCII or Unicode characters and binary files which are composed of bits. And text files are intended to be read and edited by humans and binary files are not. They're really not. It's very pretty well impossible for humans to read these and to edit them. There's many many file formats and there's usually an extension or a suffix on a file name like .pdf which tells you the kind of file format but there's no reason that this extension has to be correct, and for many files, it's not necessary. And there's one important file format that we should mention, which is XML. XML is a file format where there are end tags that start with something in angle brackets and end with something in angle brackets, but there's a forward slash at the beginning. So for instance, if we had these two tags, in between these tags would be an address. Now XML is very convenient for machines, for computers to manipulate, but it's very hard for humans to read. So here's a question. Which of the following is an extension for an audio file format? I'll give you a moment. Okay, welcome back. Well, I think you probably all know the answer to this. It's B. Dot MP3. Okay. Um, I think you can probably figure out the other ones as well. Okay, so let's go on to data compression. So Compression is used to reduce the size of a file, while decompression recovers the original data. Uh, and sometimes we want to reduce the, the size of the file either to store it or to transport it, or both. Um, now, data compression can either be lossless, that means nothing is lost, and when we decompress it, we get back what we started with. Or it can be lossy, which is, it's irreversible. When we decompress, uh, we won't get back what we've had, what we started with. Something is lost. Now there's many different ways of doing, de doing data compression. I'm going to mention two of the classic approaches. One is called Huffman Coley. This is named after David Huffman. Uh, was done in the 1950s. The idea here is that in different languages, 
we have different frequencies of symbols in different situations. You have different frequencies of symbols. It doesn't have to be a language. But we, are, we have some kind of, of files full of symbols, and some symbols are more frequent than others. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to represent the symbols that are very frequent with the fewest number of bits. So for in many files, the most frequent symbol is the space. We want to represent that with the fewest number of bits possible. And these uh, bits, we will have a code for each of these symbols. And these codes are given by a Huffman tree. And basically, a Huffman tree can be generated automatically from a set of character frequency pairs. So if we're, let's say, talking about English, and we know what are the frequency of different characters in the, let's say, the English alphabet, we can use that and give it to a program that will create our Huffman tree. And then our Huffman tree will give us a code, which is a sequence of bits for every character. And the characters that occur the most often, let's say in English, something like S or E, will have the fewest number of bits, let's say one or two bits. And characters that are not very common, let's say like the letter Z or letter Q or a character that no one uses anymore, the character, for, well, it's written like this, the character for meaning sense, those would have a lot of bits. And this provides lossless compression. So you get a sequence of bits like this And the first character might be that many bits. And it's done in such a way that we can just go down and read off the characters. And it's compressed because characters that are most common will use the fewest number of bits. So that's Hoffman coding. Another type of compression, and there's different algorithms, but one is the LZ77 algorithm. This is due to Abraham Lempel and Jacob Zev, and it's called uh, LZ for Lempel Zev and 77 because this was developed in 1977. What it does is it replaces repeated strings by references to earlier occurrences. And so a reference has this form. It has the number of bits that we're going to repeat and how many bits, bytes, I should say, we go back to get, um, I should say, the number of, of bytes that will occur and the number of bytes that we have to go back. So for a character, we'll basically have one byte per character. Um, and what's good about this kind of compression uh, is if there are a lot of characters that are being repeated very often, let's say like spaces, we we can, um, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say characters. If we have many strings that are being repeated, like a string of spaces, then we can uh, represent these in a very compact way. Uh, and so this provides lossless compression, and it's a basis for many common compression algorithms like zip. And so let me demonstrate it on this string. So the, basically, the way this works is if we start reading this, we have a B, we have a G, we have an F, and then we have, we're going to have a string of five bytes or five characters, and we go back to. So if we go back to, we go back to here, and now we have a G and an F, and we continue. So we have GF, GF, so we put another GF, and now we have a G. So basically we produced um, these five characters. And so we have these three and these five characters. And then what we do is we produce two characters, and we go back eight, and that eight gets us to these two, 
and we repeat those. And then we have GB. So that's basically how it works. Okay, so I'm going to take a little break from our lecture from uh, last week. We talked about software modules. So here's a sort of a review question. Which of the following is an example of a software module? I'll give you a moment to think about that. Okay, welcome back. Well, let me remind you what a software module is. A software module has two parts. It has an interface and it has an implementation. The interface is a, is a language. A set of, you can, you can sometimes think of a set of operators. And implementation is implementation of that language. So which corresponds to this? Well, there's two examples. The first is an instance of a type class. Remember, a, a type class has a set of, has a set of uh, functions which are called methods. And an instance of that gives implementations to those methods. So this is definitely true. Um, this, another example is an object. And an object actually equals data plus operations. And the... the um, operations, and these are also called methods, these operations are the interface of the object, and the object also includes the implementation. So both of these are really examples of software modules. And software modules appear in many different ways in programming languages. They often appear, often in many programming languages, an example of a software module is something that is called a module. So a module in a programming language is an example of a software module. Now you may have been wondering what data structures are. It's a pretty simple idea. They're a structured collection of values that are created and manipulated by a computer program. And there's many examples, but some good examples are finite sequences of values. So these could be lists, arrays, and records. They could be stacks and queues. They could be linked lists. So you can see data structures that store finite sequences of values are a very big example of data structures. In Haskell, we have algebraic data types, which are often called inductive types, and there's many examples, enumerated types, sum types, product types, recursive types. We can have various kinds of trees and graphs, and we can have objects, which I just mentioned, objects contain together data and operations. And then there's many kinds of tables, including hash tables. And the last thing we're going to talk about today are databases. A database is just an organized collection of data. That's all it is. But the most common kind of databases today are relational databases. In a relational database, a database is organized as a collection of relations. A relation is just a subset of tuples. Let's say n tuples. That's all a relation is. So each relation looks each member of this relation looks like, let's say, A1, AN. So that's what a relational database is based on. And databases are designed to be modified in query. That's what they're made for. They're made to store data, and we can change what this data is, and we can 
ask questions about it. And I want to mention there's a language called SQL, stands for Structured Query Language. This is the most popular language used for querying databases. Okay, so this completes our topic for today, and it completes, I should say, our lecture for today, and it completes our topic about data. So until next time, see you then.